Welcome back, everybody, as we uh, wrap up the study through the book of Colossians in the New Testament today. And uh, if you would be turning there, please, we're going to pick up at verse 18 um, in chapter 3. Again, we will finish, uh, finish the study today, and as the Lord wills, if he doesn't call me home uh, before I finish it here. And so, again... Uh, follow along in your Bibles, Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to pick up at, at verse 18. Um, actually, from chapter 3, verse 18, up through chapter 4 and verse 1, um, they're, they're pretty much uh, basic summary statements of a topic or subject that is covered more completely in and more thoroughly in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, and ironically, our Wednesday evening Bible study uh, we, group, we just finished up Ephesians uh, this past Wednesday, and so we just recently covered the, the, the topics here that are addressed in, uh, again, verses, uh, verse 18 uh, in chapter 3 through verse 1 in chapter 4, and I will, I will uh, give some of the detail from Ephesians chapter 5 to these summary statements that are given here uh, in, in the book of Colossians, but I won't, I won't go into as much detail as I would in the book of Ephesians. We, we will likely, um, if the Lord wills, again, maybe in a year and a half or two years or so, um, probably preach through the, the book of Ephesians again. But um, again, let's start with reading verses 18 and 19 in Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> It says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord, and husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And so uh, we get into this topic that is uh, oftentimes uncomfortable for various folks, and I that is primarily because of the the call here in Scripture for wives to submit to the leadership of their of their husbands in the home. Um, it's it's misunderstood uh, uh, quite a bit, and actually the book of Ephesians uh, chapter five again tells us that God's design of marriage is um, actually to to demonstrate the the picture of the the church, those of us who accept Jesus in true saving faith, and our relationship with Jesus, so that as uh, people see a husband interact with his wife in their marriage. People are to be reminded of how how Jesus loved the church so much that he gave up his life for the church. In the same, people are supposed to see that in in marriage relationships that the husband loves the wife to such a degree, even as to being willing to give his life up for her, and then in turn, as the church. All of us who accept Jesus in true saving faith, as we are supposed to submit to the leadership of Jesus in our lives, when people see a wife interacting with her husband in their marriage, they are to be, it says again in Ephesians chapter 5, they are to be reminded of how um, we as the church submit to Jesus' uh, leadership in, in our lives. And so um, the, the irony is also that, uh, or the, the reality is also that within the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the, the God the Son submits to the God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit submits to God the Son and God the Father, and so you actually have this um, sub, submissive relationship even within the Trinity of, of God, and it's not because God the Son or God the Holy Spirit are any, any less uh, God, they are all God, all three are God, the three in one, and it's the same way in the marriage relationship. It is not that the the woman is any less of a being or uh, any less in any way than the husband is. It's simply a matter of how God has designed it, um, that within the home, because there can only be one uh, one head, and my former pastor always used to say, you know, if you if you have um, have a, uh, some creature with two heads, uh, it would be called a monster, a two-headed monster. And with, within the home, there also needs to be 
ultimately, when push comes to shove, one head, and God has designated that to be uh, the husband. And so, uh, again, this this summary statement here very basically and succinctly sum, sums this up and says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord, and husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Well, let's look at verse 20 then, and it talks again just very briefly about the children in the in the household. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Um, I will say that this is most likely children of any age who are still living in their parents' home, that as long as uh, a child, even an adult child, is living in their parents' home, um, they they are to uh, submit to the, to their parents in in their home, and and of course we are always to, to to love and to honor our parents, but relative to obeying, as long as uh, as long as a child is living, even at, again even an adult child is living in their parents' home, they are to obey them, and that's God's command. Uh, verse twenty one then. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Now, this word, uh, English word, translated here, fathers, um, that is uh, that is translated from the Greek word pateras. Um, there are some Bible scholars who who uh, believe that that should actually be translated here instead of fathers, uh, parents. Um, so, so it would say, parents, do not embitter your your children. Um, actually, the the same form of of word of the word pateras um, in Hebrews 11 verse 23 is translated parents. And so, again, many many uh, scholar, Bible scholars believe that this this applies to both to, to both parents that parents should not exasperate their children, uh, you know, or embitter their their children. Um, some examples of that would be uh, parents that are that are overly harsh. With their kids, um, parents that would have unreasonable expectations, expectations that kids would have little chance of, of living up to, um, parents being overly critical all the time, maybe having excessive rules that, that again just become overwhelming to kids, and especially you know different ages and so forth. Younger kids can be you know em embittered, um, frazzled over over things that they're just not capable of even doing yet, but then even as kids get older, they can still become exasperated with um, unreasonable expectations and um, overly critical and harsh treatment from parents. Yes, there should be discipline, and Scripture speaks about that elsewhere uh, too, but in this case, this is a, a warning against parents to not take these kinds of things too far. Now, Verses 22 um, through verse 1 in chapter 4 is another topic area that actually is often criticized by people that do not uh, believe that the Bible is actually a book of authority that we should pay any attention to. And when we start reading it, you'll probably figure out why pretty quickly, but but there's a very good explanation for all this. Let's, let's start reading it at, um, at verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrong, and there is no favoritism. And then the first verse in chapter 4, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. And so the topic is regarding slaves and, and, and masters. And again, we, sh we need to understand that this is directed to slaves that are believers, true believers in Jesus, and masters who are true believers in Jesus. Obviously, either one could have the other. Uh, a slave could have a master who is not 
a believer and a master could have a slave that wasn't a believer, but as in the husband and wife relationship, that doesn't affect how uh, we are to handle what God directs us to do. Now, again, Bible critics would use the, the fact that a, a pas passages like this even exist in the Bible to, to say that the Bible you know, is not a trustworthy document or whatever. The, the thing is, though, again, we always need to look to original culture, an original uh, audience, original context that the, that the words were given in. And the fact was, in this context, in this culture, when, when Paul was dealing with the church in, in Colossae, um, probably 50% of people in Roman culture were slaves. And in fact, uh, uh, there were many doctors and lawyers and other professionals and so forth that, that were slaves as well. It, it, was, it was simply the accepted way that, that things were done. Um, and in fact, there were any number of slaves that would sell themselves into slavery because they could actually have a much better chance of surviving and even a better life as a slave than they than they might be able to on on their own. Um, obviously, there were horribly harsh slave masters, and and you know it, it wasn't by any means. I'm not you know nobody's trying to defend that it was a good thing. But the, but the Bible it does not address cultural circumstances many times. It addresses how we as Christians should handle ourselves when we wherever we find ourselves in different cultural situations, um, God still has directions for, uh, for how we should handle ourselves in those circumstances. And, and here with slaves, again, uh, the direction is that slaves are actually to, were, were to obey their masters the same way as they would obey Jesus. And that if they didn't, if they, and in fact, if they sinned, if they stole from their master, masters or even, you know, tried to harm their masters or kill their masters or, or you know, anything like that, that because they were a slave was not an excuse for them not to obey God's directions and that they would be held accountable for that. Now, again, uh, you, some of you probably would be thinking, well, okay, so if I buy this, then what, what's still, what's the application here for, for most of us today where we live and so forth? Um, well, the application is the very similar circumstances in the workplace, that um, there are many true Christians, true followers of Jesus who are bosses in the workplace or even business owners in the workplace. And there are, uh, there are many um, true followers of Jesus who are workers then under those bosses or, or owners. And the same types of rules would apply that if, if I am working for a boss or an owner, I am to give my best and not just when he's watching me, but at all times, because God is always watching me, I am to, to do my best and, and to work for my boss as I would even work for Jesus. And conversely, if I'm a boss in a workplace or if I am a business, business owner, I am to treat my employees well and, and not be overly harsh with them because I'm to remember that I have a master as well. I have a boss as well. If I'm a boss in a workplace or a business owner, uh, yeah, well, I still have a boss. Uh, and my boss, my master, of course, is Almighty God. And so um, how, how do I want to be treated by my master, by my boss? Is it the way I treat those who, who are under my authority? Do I want to be treated the way I treat those who are under who are under my authority. These are the kinds of things that, that we are to con, consider and, and the way that these passages are still very, very applicable yet still today. Let's read verse two. Verse two says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Devote yourselves to prayer. That's being persistent, uh, praying continually, as 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says. Um, praying at various times throughout the day. How, how are you all doing with that? How are you doing with, with not only praying, not only maybe a once a day prayer, but how are you doing with praying throughout the day? Being kind of in a content, continual mindset of prayer. How about being watchful? Being watchful is being spiritually alert to prayer needs. There are so many things to pray for if you're watching for them, if you're looking 
for them. Here in our church, we have our, our weekly prayer list with many things to be prayed over. We have a, a prayer chain where those who participate are notified of immediate prayer requests that, that, that we pray for. We have people like our missionaries, the Russells, who um, make contact through various means to advise those of us who who seek to pray for them and their situations at various times they will notify us and, and many of us pray then for their needs there are so many things there to pray pray for there are so many occasions of needs for prayer and then we simply should be in communication with our lord continually um, that that is how we are to be devoted to prayer again are we are we devoted to prayer? And finally, we are to be thankful in prayer. A long time ago with my kids, I had come across a thing in teaching kids about praying. The first thing we really always ought to do is come before our Lord in thanksgiving. And then after we give proper thanks to him, then move on to actually making requests. Verses three and four. And pray for us too. Again, this was Paul writing this. He's talking about himself and others who were, were there helping him where, where he was locked up, imprisoned. He says, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Referring again to his imprisonment. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. So Paul was in, imprisoned. He was actually under house arrest, uh, chained to Roman guards 24 hours a day. Um, but he was still looking for opportunities to tell people about Jesus. He, even when he was chained up and confined, um, he, he was still using the circumstance to look to have opportunities to tell people about Jesus. And that's the same with us still today. Um, we often find ourselves in circumstances that wouldn't be what we choose. And certainly today among the, you know, the whole COVID situation and so forth, we, don't, we wouldn't choose to be in these situations, but we should still look in the midst of the situation that we find ourselves in. We should still be looking for the opportunities to tell people about Jesus. So Paul wanted the Colossian believers to pray for God to give him opportunities to, to open doors and he wanted them to pray that, that he would use those opportunities, uh, opportunities by, by clearly proclaiming the message of salvation by faith in Jesus. Um, I often talk about the three open prayer that evangelist Ron Hutchcraft talks about. It's a three open prayer for open doors. Number one, open Lord, open me a door of opportunity to, to talk to somebody about Jesus. Number two, Lord, open the doors of their heart so that they would be receptive to what I say. And number three, open my mouth. Have me seize the opportunity. See it and seize it and use it and, and take advantage of the opportunity to tell others about Jesus. I would love for you to pray that kind of a prayer for me as Paul asked the Colossians to pray for him. Pray that God would give me opportunities and help me see and uh, see the opportunity and take advantage of it and open to people's hearts. But I would pray that you would pray that prayer for yourself as well, because again, it's not just preachers that are tasked to do these things. Verses five and six. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Outsiders are unbelievers, and the reality is that's most of the world around us. Those of us who have truly accepted Jesus and saving faith, most of the, the rest of the world are not believers. And so uh, these outsiders are most of the world around us. We are to be wise in the way that we act in everyday life. People are watching. You represent Jesus. Make the most of your opportunities to be Jesus to other people. You know, on the negative side of things, uh, do you realize how much damage we can do to our testimony and to the testimony of Christianity in general when we don't act like followers of Jesus are supposed to act? Do you realize the damage we can do? 
Once again, it matters how we live. To those who would say, well, I don't, I don't care what somebody thinks about me. That, I think these verses clearly tell you you're wrong. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should care. And we want to present Jesus to people. And we want to show people what a true follower of Jesus looks like. That they would desire to look that way as well. We must speak with grace. Our speech seasoned with salt. Salt helps things taste better, right? And our interaction with unbelievers should lead them toward something better. Toward a much better life and an infinitely better eternity. We should be leading people to salvation through faith in Jesus. We need to know how to defend um, uh, our faith. We need to know how to explain our faith in, in, in good ways. We need to know how to say the right things. Well, let's read verses 7 and 8. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. Now this starts, uh, verses 7 and 8 here, starts the last 12 verses of the book of Colossians. And um, these, are, these are verses, the, these last verses in this book are the kinds of verses that honestly I, I find are seldom mentioned in sermons and seldom even read by, by Christians. And, and that's a shame. Yes, they are a bunch of strange sounding names um, uh, in, in, these, in these passages here, starting with this Tychicus guy. Um, it, it is uh, a lot of personal greetings and, and information that at first glance we think, well, what does, you know, what does that have to do with, with us today? But as with all scripture, these verses contain a lot of good information for us as followers of Jesus, and they help us make actually tie-ins to other parts of Scripture and understand other parts of Scripture as well. Tychicus, again, is the, the first person mentioned here among many in these last verses. I was, yeah, I was tempted to say that, you know, only that, well, it appears obvious that Tychicus was the one that Paul sent to deliver the letter to, to the Colossian church, and, and then just leave it at that. But I, I, did, I really want to share some more uh, information about Tychicus because I think it helps us understand and appreciate folks like him who are, who are mentioned in the Bible. Maybe, maybe not mentioned in a very big way, but they're, but they're mentioned. And, and we would maybe consider them to be minor characters in the Bible uh, in the big scheme of things. But I believe they, they are much more than that. And among anything else, they are actually good examples still to us today, and I'll have more to say about that. Tychicus is mentioned five times in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 4, it says he was going to travel with Paul to deliver an offering from Gentile or non-Jewish churches to poor Jewish believers uh, in Jerusalem. The willingness of Tychicus to travel with Paul all the way to Jerusalem shows how committed he was to, to serve Jesus with Paul. Because travel in the ancient world was a whole lot more difficult and dangerous than, than it is in most places today. Tychicus would be away from his family and friends and his church for a long time. And Paul was repeatedly warned that trouble awaited him when he got to Jerusalem. But Tychicus stuck with him anyway. Tychicus may even have stayed with Paul after he was arrested in Jerusalem. And through the three trials that followed, and then even on the voyage to Rome, um, that included being shipwrecked on the on the island of, of Malta, uh, we don't know that for sure. The Bible doesn't mention that for sure if Tychicus was still with Paul then. It seems like he, he most likely was. But in any case, we do know that Tychicus was with Paul uh, during Paul's imprisonment in Rome because that's the place where... Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians and gave it to Tychicus, uh, as well as we'll see later two other letters as well. That's, that's where Paul was when he wrote them, and he gave them to Tychicus, who was free to go, and Paul, of course, wasn't. He was chained up and, and asked Tychicus to carry them 
to the destination that Paul intended them to go. And so we know Tychicus was there with Paul trying to help him during his imprisonment, his first imprisonment in Rome. Well, speaking of, of that journey, that trip that Tychicus would have had to have taken from Rome, when he took the, the, the writings that Paul gave him to deliver to these certain audiences, original audiences, that eventually then even became books of the Bible, because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit and protected by, by the Holy Spirit of God. Um, speaking of that journey um, from Rome to the city of Colossae, it, it would have been quite a rough journey. Tychicus would have first had to have crossed much of Italy on foot and then sailed across the Adriatic Sea. And then he would have had to walk across Greece on foot. And he would have sailed then across the Aegean Sea to the coast of Asia Minor, and then once he got to the coast of Asia Minor, he still would have had a hundred mile walk to get to the city of Colossae. Um, that's that's quite a that's quite a trip. Um, quite quite different from jumping in a car or jumping in an airplane, you know, or a jet or a train even today. Well, after Paul was released from his first imprisonment in Rome. Um, he, he may have sent Tychicus to temporarily fill in for Titus as the pastor uh, of, a, of a church on the island of Crete. You can read about that in, in Titus 3, verse 12. And 2 Timothy 4, verse 12 says that near the end of Paul's life, he sent Tychicus to temporarily fill in for Timothy as the pastor of the church in, in Ephesus. I... I think all these different facts that we can gather from other places in the Bible, I think that makes up quite a resume for this guy Tychicus. And again, I believe it is a great example to us still today, all these years later, how willing are we to live a life of service to Jesus to the extent the way this Tychicus guy did? How does our spiritual resume compared to the resume of Tychicus. And remember, most church-going folks wouldn't even know anything about Tychicus or, or even recognize his name, right? I mean, it just is not... People would know who Paul is and, and Peter and some of, the, some of those characters, but most people aren't going to know who Tychicus is. Or, you know, he, he was not famous. He's still not famous today. Neither, neither am I. N neither are you. But we can still serve God the way Tychicus did. And we should. Verse 9. He, this, that's Tychicus, is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. And so Tychicus traveled to Colossae with another guy. His name was Onesimus. Onesimus was the runaway slave that you can read about in the book of Philemon in the New Testament, just a little one-chapter book. Onesimus had ended up in Rome where he met Paul, and Paul led him to saving faith in Jesus. This was after Onesimus ran away from his slave owner. So now Onesimus was a brother in Christ, to his former slave owner, who was Philemon. And in Philemon's home, the house church in Colossae actually met in Philemon's home, from whom Onesimus had run away from, and what we read in the book of Philemon is that he apparently even stole from him before, before he ran away. But in that book of Philemon, we, we can read that Paul actually asked Philemon to forgive Onesimus and accept him as his brother in Christ. But Anyway, Tychicus likely took this letter to the church in Colossae, what our biblical book of Colossians, as well as the letter to the church in Ephesus, our biblical book of Ephesians, and the one chapter book of Philemon, the New Testament book of Philemon. Most likely, Tychicus took all three of those writings of Paul, and Onesimus went with him, and they made this trip from Rome to uh, that region in Asia Minor where uh, Ephesus and Colossae were located. Well, verses 10 and 11. 
My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. And so we have uh, three other guys mentioned here. Aristarchus was a guy from, from the region of Thessalonica. Um, he is mentioned in other places in the New Testament as being with Paul um, while he was in prison, being with Paul during a riot in the city of Ephesus, and being with Paul when Paul was shipwrecked, again, there on, on Malta when he was being transported as a prisoner to, to Rome. And so Aristarchus had gone through quite a bit with Paul. Mark was a cousin of Barnabas. Mark had, had, had actually started out with Barnabas and Paul on Paul's first missionary journey that we read about in the book of Acts. But then uh, at, in the very beginning of the trip, Mark, trip, Mark decided uh, this isn't for me and backed out and went back home. And that ended up causing eventually a squabble between Paul and, and Barnabas because on Paul's second trip, he was going to take Barnabas with him and Barnabas wanted to bring Mark again, but Paul wasn't in for it. He said, hey, he quit on us last time. He didn't want to take him. And so they ended up having a little squabble over that. But later on, Mark then uh, was restored in, in good faith with, with Paul. And that, an example of that, of course, is what he says about him here. This guy, Jesus Justice, and yes, there, there were other people named Jesus, uh, other Jews named Jesus uh, during that time. This was uh, Jesus who was also known by, by his Greek or Roman name of Justice. Uh, this guy is not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. But all three of these guys, Aristarchus, Mark, and this Jesus Justice, um, they sent their greetings to the people, the believers in Colossae. And these were the only three men, Paul says, Jewish men, the only three Jews who were serving with Paul. Of course, Paul being a, a Jewish man as well. Um, when someone accepted Jesus during that, when a Jewish man, a, you know, a Jewish person, a man or woman, accepted Jesus back in, in those days of the early church, their Jewish family disowned them. And even probably most of their Jewish friends disowned them. They were they became then completely estranged from all that they had known, all the people that they had known, and 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 so forth for for the most part. And frankly, that actually still happens today. Um, it happens, you know, especially in Israel. Um, to understand that when someone is baptized to demonstrate their faith in Jesus, their family holds a funeral and considers them dead. There's a great sacrificial price that has been paid in that kind of a way by many believers, many Jewish believers since since the day of 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 Paul in the early church and still happening today. And the reality is that, that that type of sacrifice also happens with people of like different faiths when a, you know, a Muslim person or a Hindu person converts to Christianity. Oftentimes their families disown them. And, and of course, even many uh, non-religious uh, families, when, when a family member starts to seriously follow Jesus as their Lord and Savior, oftentimes there, at a minimum, is significant tension in the family because, oh, well, yeah, she got, she got religion now. And, and often there's a lot of tension and, and pressure and, and hard feelings and so forth, even in families that way. And so these are all part of the kinds of sacrifices that have to be made sometimes to to follow to follow Jesus and again are we willing to make such sacrifices verses 12 and 13 Epaphras who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings he is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God mature and fully assured i vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Of course, in chapter 1 in Colossians, we saw that uh, Epaphras had started the church in Colossae and personally led many of those people there to save saving faith in Jesus. He was their pastor. He had traveled, Epaphras had traveled from Colossae to to see Paul in, in prison in, in Rome to update him about the church in Colossae uh, as well as to tell him about some of the troubles that they were having with these false teachers that we've read about a good bit through the book of Colossae. 
Epaphras sent his greetings then through this letter that Paul wrote um, to his people back in Colossae. And Paul, Paul assured them that Epaphras was always wrestling in prayer for them and working very hard for them, uh, even so far removed from them, as well as for the believers in the nearby cities of Laodicea and Hierapolis. Verse 14, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. So two more guys sent their greetings through Paul's writing. Dr. Luke, of course, uh, was the one that the Holy Spirit led to write the Gospel of Luke, as well as the book of Acts. And he served quite a bit with Paul. I suspect that Dr. Luke gave up quite a bit to serve Jesus. And then the second guy that sent his greetings, who was also with Paul at this time when he was in prison in Rome, his name was Demas. Unfortunately, uh, the end of Demas, uh, the story of Demas, and at least what we know in the Bible, is, is not good because 2 Timothy 4.10 records Paul saying that Demas had later deserted him. Um, some folks, again, like Demas, end up not being willing to pay the price of sacrifice to serve Jesus. And again, that's still, that kind of thing still happens today. And the question is, again, are we willing to pay the price of sacrifice to serve Jesus? Verse 15. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And so Paul asked the folks in the city of Colossae, the believers in the Colossian church, asked them to pass on his greetings, Paul's greetings to the believers in Laodicea, as well as to a lady named Nympha and the believers who met in her house. Re remember now, uh, quickly, there were no church buildings in the early church. It was it was probably 175 years before there were actual buildings specifically to serve as meeting places for Christians. Um, in those 175 years, people met outdoors and, and in people's houses and things like that. Uh, we don't know for sure, but there's a good chance this, that Nympha's house was actually um, in the city of Hierapolis that's been mentioned a couple of times here and that that's where the believers in Hierapolis met. We, we don't know that for sure, but there's a good chance of that. Verse 16, heading down the home stretch. Hang in there with me. After this letter has been read to you, that, that would have been the Colossian believers, the, city, the believers in the city of Colossae, who it was originally sent to, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. So Paul instructed here that this letter to the Colossians be also read in the church that was in the city of Laodicea and that the Colossians would also read a letter that it says would be would come from Laodicea. We many believe that, that it was probably a, another letter that Paul wrote and some believe that it was not a, a letter that was inspired by the Holy Spirit so it didn't make it in the Bible but others uh, John MacArthur being one of them, believe that this letter that the Colossians would receive from Laodicea was actually his, his uh, letter to the Ephesians, what became the book of Ephesians uh, that, that's in our New Testament as, as well. In any, case, in any case, it's a clear example of how, how these, these writings that were inspired by the Holy Spirit um, were circulated among churches back at that time and ever since then. And copies have been, you know, continue to be made and distributed to, to various churches. And still today, they, they have become, of course, what is the book, the books, of, what are the books of the Bible that, that we have, uh, have today. Uh, the, and they apply just as much to us today as they did back then, because the word of God is timeless. Verse 17, tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. So it sounds like a little bit of a, uh, an encouragement or maybe even exhortation or a strong urging for this, this guy Archippus to, to do uh, complete the work that he had received in the Lord. Um, Archippus was probably Philemon's son. Remember Philemon? Uh, that's who the runaway slave uh, had, had, had ran away from. And, and Philemon had this church meeting in his home in the city of Colossae, and 
it is believed that this Archippus was, was his son. Um, he may have been actually even filling in as pastor at the church in his dad's home while um, Epaphras was away visiting with Paul in, in Rome. Um, the example that, that was provided um, you know, by, by these people mentioned previous, previous to Archippus here at the end of the book of Colossians probably would have been a, a, a pretty good motivation to Archippus to stick to what he was tasked with doing. And once again, I, I would say to you that um, you know, the sacrifices made by a lot of these people that are mentioned here um, should still be a great uh, reminder, encouragement, exhortation to us still today to do the same. Many believers through the years have sacrificed greatly to serve Jesus. And in many places today, there are many believers that still sacrifice greatly. Shouldn't we be willing to do our part? I want to, I know it's getting long here, but I really want to read this. We're almost done. Hang in there. I want to read this out of the Holman, the Holman Bible commentary, the Holman commentary on the book of, of Colossians. A uh, story about a lady by the name of Janice Munson. She was 39, and her, her and her husband Dan were on a shopping trip in Littleton, Colorado, when they came up behind a silver minivan moving along at a very slow pace. The minivan swerved first onto the shoulder and then into oncoming traffic. Janice glanced into the minivan and was startled to see the driver appeared to be asleep. Dan engaged his flashers and began waving his arm and blinking his headlights to warn approaching traffic. Janice knew she had to act. Without a word to her husband, she jumped from their car. Within seconds, she was running alongside the van, which again was just you know, going along at a slow pace. She grabbed the door handle, banged on the window, and yelled, you're going the wrong way. The woman only stared back vacantly. Janice swung the door open and jumped inside the moving vehicle. She slammed the gear shift into park, bringing the, the van to an abrupt stop. Seconds later... A stream of cars coming from the opposite direction whizzed safely past the, the van and the, and the people in it. Afterwards, police told Janice that the van driver was a diabetic, suffering from insulin shock. She was taken to a nearby hospital, treated and released. In a world without heroes, George Roche defines heroism as an extraordinary act of goodness performed by ordinary persons from whom we do not expect it. True of Janice Munson, just a 39-year-old wife and mom, <clears throat> getting a little choked up, just a 39-year-old wife and mom who risked her life to save lives of others. Extraordinary action, ordinary people. That's true of biblical heroes as well. We tend to make biblical characters into super saints. A careful look reminds us that they were just normal. Yes, some of them accomplished great things. We read of their accomplishments in the biblical record. Their records also include some embarrassing flaws. Remember Abraham's deception and Sarah's doubt and David's adultery and Peter's denial and others. They were just normal folks that God used to accomplish his purposes. My heroes have always been normal. In Colossians 4, we meet some of these normal people, these odd-named folks that we've read about here at the end of the book. As the letter closes, Paul introduces us to his partners in ministry. Through these normal heroes, God accomplished his work. The truth about spirituality is that it's obedience in the ordinary, that it's obedience is in the ordinary, by the ordinary. Genuine spiritual living is not for the favored few. What about service for, for the Christ who has the supremacy over all of us? Does such a supreme savior use only special people, certain people? Of course not. The truth about spirituality and service is that they're both open to, to ordinary people like you and me.
Let's read verse 18 to close. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Paul wrote the, the closing, the, that salutation in his own hand. Um, he normally had other people write what he dictated to, the, to them. Um, many believe that he had poor, poor eyesight up, up close. He often um, just wrote a little bit of a closing to a letter. That would help authenticate it, that it really came from him. Of course, he said again, pray for me as he was in chains and imprisoned in Rome. And he closed with one of his common closing comments, grace be with you. And I want to close. I know, again, this got a little bit long, but I want to close with just a short conclusion, again, out of the Holman Bible commentary. It says, Colossians is all about proper place. False teachers were attempting to remove Jesus Christ from his proper place of absolute supremacy. Paul tells believers that the proper place for their ambitions is heaven above and not earth below. Prayer certainly has a prominent place in Colossians. The letter begins with two prayers and closes with two references to prayer. Sandwiched in between are our responsibilities. Know the truth and avoid error. Live out our new life by developing character and deepening relationships. If ordinary people like you and me are to have any hope of fulfilling these compelling responsibilities, then prayer must have its proper place in our lives. The truth about spirituality and service is that spirituality is keeping Christ central and service is for ordinary people. Ordinary people who love their Savior. Let's pray. Father God, help us. Help us live according to the instructions that you give us in your word. Help us, Lord, realize that though we are just ordinary, everyday people, you desire us, you command us to serve you. And we can see from the pages of your word that ordinary, everyday people like us can accomplish extraordinary things through the power of your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, give us the conviction to live as we should. Give us the conviction to sacrifice as we should. Give us the conviction to be your servants and shine the light of Jesus to the world around us. We pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Sorry for getting all busted up there at the end. God bless you all. Lord willing, next week I'm going to start in the book of First Peter. I'd ask you to maybe read the first couple chapters of First Peter several times this week. And as the Lord wills next week, I'll start preaching through First Peter verse by verse. Again, God bless you all.